a little bit of endocrine now, all right? You gotta learn endocrine. Endocrine's, uh, believe it or not, actually uh, pretty heavy on the boards. They're gonna ask it in various different ways. The nice thing about endocrine is like statistics, although I don't like to compare anything to statistics, is that once you understand it at the level of uh, level one, or step one, step two and step three, it's the same level. It's a complete pathway. So if you get the basics down, I don't care what level of the test you're taking, you're going to destroy it the rest of the way. All right, so there's a couple rules with endocrine. Actually, i take a sidebar here real quick. Actually, i got to show off my family. Uh, as of January this year, I, my wife and I got great news. We're expecting our first, our second, and our third. Yeah, it's my boys. Yeah, so. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, we're expecting triplets. So, three little balls of fun, I guess. Uh, I guess I'll find out. Uh, so, yeah, we're, we're pretty pumped up. Um, it was a long road, but uh, it, it'll pay off, I hope. <laughs> no, nah, it, it's good. So, All right, so endocrine, endocrine, endocrine. All right, some of the rules for endocrine. One of the biggest rules that everybody seems to forget for endocrine, if I'm going from point A to point Z, and I screw up anything along that pathway, everything going to that path is increased. Everything after that damage is decreased. That's the major rule for all of endocrine. So if I give you an example where somebody, oh, I don't know, let's say a guy has a screwed up Sertoli cell in his testes, I know that from Sertoli cells, I have MIF, I have inhibin, I have anything else? Spermatogenesis. If I screw up that Sertoli cell, I know that FSH is one of the stimuluses to the Sertoli cell. So that should be up. Sertoli cells affected, so everything I just listed from Sertoli cell, inhibin, MIF, as well as spermatogenesis will all be decreased. Same thing when you talk about thyroid diseases. What did I say was the rule when you have two things to memorize? Memorize one, and that plays a big role in endocrine. If I need to study hypothyroidism versus hyperthyroidism, they're the exact same thing, just the opposite. Understand one, understand it well, meaning lab value-wise, and ultimately, the other one's just the opposite. One of the things that I also see students do in the past, too, is especially for step two and step three, and some step one questions, you're given labs. And a lot of you deviate right to the labs on a question. <coughs> dangerous, dangerous move. Because you're trying to decipher based off of labs, not what the chief complaint is. Your labs should be there to di differentiate your differential. Okay, so that should be the last thing to basically confirm your differential. So be very careful with that. Don't run to the labs first. All right, so for endocrine, a couple simple definitions that we need to get out of the way that they love to ask about. Exocrine. Let me just get a couple definitions out of the way here. Exocrine, exocrine glands. Well, exocrine means that basically it is secreted into a duct, right? Secreted into a duct versus if I'm talking about endocrine, I know that that's stimulated or released hematogenously, secreted uh, products into the blood. How do I know that? Well, we talk about like pituitary, the pancreas, the testes, the thyroid, the adrenal gland, different things like that. I know that endocrine is basically into the blood. Exocrine is into a duct. Again, now pancreas can be endocrine or exocrine, you know that, right? Because insulin would go hematogenous versus uh, trypsinogen and things like that are going to go into the ducts. So paracrine secreted, then it works only on the vicinity. I have the example there, somatostatin, but you know a heck of a lot more. Maybe, uh, oh, I don't know, norepinephrine, acetylcholine. Aren't those neurotransmitters that are secreted and then work on the postsynaptic cleft? So they work right in that vicinity. That would be the definition of paracrine. Well, there's autocrine secreted by the cell that it works on, granulosa cell. I know the granulosa cells in the ovaries, and when it goes ahead and via aromatase converts androgens to estrogen, that estrogen causes a negative feedback within the whole pathway. 
also that estrogen is self-stimulatory, circles right back around and stimulates that granulosa cell. So that's why during the first phase of the menstrual period, estrogen keeps climbing, keeps climbing, keeps climbing because of this self-stimulatory phase. And that again is autocrine. Well, I have apocrine, or otherwise known as merocrine. That's the tip of the cell that's secreted within, uh, secretes within substance. So like your sweat glands, maybe a woman's breast milk secreting the fat globules. That's just the tip. So lactation would be apocrine. And last but not least, holocrine, the entire cell is secreted. How do I know that? Well, when you're at the gym or you're out in the park chasing that squirrel, you get done and basically your armpits are all sweaty, your groin's all sweaty. These are where I find those type of glands, very sebaceous type glands. So you're going to be familiar with the definitions. All right, so how are we going to look at hormones? We're going to look simple enough of where, what the name is. The main stimulus, the inhibitor, why would I want to even stimulate this? This is the way you got to look at endocrine. Why would this hormone be released? What possibly would block this hormone from being released? Where does it go? And if I do release it, what's its main action? Why is it, I mean, again, it's, why is it being released? And then when it is, what the heck does it do? And last but not least, is there a second messenger or any miscellaneous syndromes associated with it? So when we talk about hormones, we have two types. We have steroid or water-soluble hormones. Let me ask you this. The lipid layer of all cells is basically fat, right? Simple enough. So if I have a steroid hormone that's fat-soluble, do you think it's going to have any problem getting across that uh, membrane layer? No. It'll go right across. But if I have a water-soluble protein, will that have problems? Yeah. So water-soluble hormones, uh, most common ones are the ones from the adrenal, uh, or the uh, anterior pituitary. Anterior pituitary. So if I have water-soluble hormones and they cannot get through that lipid layer, shouldn't they have some type of mechanism to be able to stimulate the nucleus to produce proteins and things like that? Right, and that's where second messengers come in. Second messengers are when I have a water-soluble protein and I have GI, which is inhibitory, GS, which is stimulatory, and then ultimately uh, to stimulate whatever's inside that cell. Steroid hormones, on the other hand, can go right into the cell, right up to the nucleus, and stimulate transcription, translation, and everything to produce proteins. Now, there is one exception to the rule. There is one steroid hormone that has its receptor not in the nucleus, but in the cytoplasm. Who's that? Cortisol. Love to ask about that on the test. Okay? Cortisol. Has an, and th it will go on to the nucleus, but again, it uh, has a cytosolic receptor first. So nuclear membrane receptor affects DNA replication, transcription, translation, works via proteins, and no second messenger system. So as we go through the slides today, if I say there's no second messenger system, you are going to respond because it's a fat soluble, okay? Fat soluble. Versus water, again, it needs that second messenger. So what I did is I created this pictorial here just to kind of show you in your notes. Steroid hormones, thyroid hormones, basically nuclear receptor, messenger RNA, and ultimately the end result would be protein synthesis. Peptide hormones are water soluble, need that G protein so I can make my cyclic AMP, which is a 90% for second messengers. Calcium might be three DAG, and ultimately getting enzyme regulation. That's a fast process. All right, so first hormone on deck, erythropoietins. Erythropoietins. Well, I said we want to know who it's made by. It's made by the renal parenchymal cells. Signal, hypoxia, not anemia. I'm sure there's a small percentage of females in here that are anemic, but they're not hypoxic. Okay? Hemoglobin is six or less, you become hypoxic. Okay? Hypoxia. Inhibitors increase oxygen. Because the whole purpose of erythropoietins are to stimulate red blood cells so that I can get those red blood cells to transport oxygen to the tissue that need that oxygen. So that's the whole purpose of kicking out erythropoietins. What does it do? Erythropoiesis, which I just described, and the second messenger, tyrosine kinase. How do I know it should be tyrosine kinase? I want you to always pick tyrosine kinase anytime I have to build something. Anytime you have to build anabolic. So I'll give you an example. Insulin, second messenger, tyrosine kinase. Isn't that anabolic? 
I'm building. So again, anytime I build, I want you to pick tyrosine kinase. So that's erythropoietin. So now let's take a look at the possibilities that could happen. So polycythemia, increase red count. The very first thing I'm going to do on, if they ask you your next best step in management, if they present a patient that has polycythemia, I want you to always choose, check the EPO levels, erythropoietin levels. Always, 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 because I have to find out the cause. Check EPO levels. So now, Tara, if I have a polycythemia patient with a normal EPO, does that make sense? No, it doesn't. Should be elevated, right? So, I mean, what do you think ultimately is going to cause that? Oh, you, you do. You do. You know this. So think about this. So here I have an increased red count. You have a patient with increased red count. And then I measure their EPO levels. And their EPO levels should, we would expect, right, that I would have them elevated. And they're not. They're kind of normal. What do you think? Has to be something else stimulating it? I'm sorry? Another statement. Your name is, I'm sorry? Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Al. Al, Al. Al, okay. Al, so another signal. Well, if I have another signal, you're saying something ectopic, right? Okay, but remember we said EPOs are going to be normal. So how about if I give you a scenario here? Let's say I have a glass of water. And inside that glass of water, I have some osmoles. And I have that same glass of water, but instead, I decide to put a crack in it. Water levels are going to fall, no surprise. Is the number of solutes going to change? No. Does it look more concentrated? Right. So if I lower the volume and not remove the solutes from that, it's going to look more concentrated. Is that a true polycythemia? No. Because I did not change the red count at all. Did not. Did not change the EPOs. I just made it look more concentrated, and we call that Gossbach syndrome or dehydration. Dehydration. What's the danger to this? You guys know that the um, Olympic Committee is in Silver Springs, Colorado, right? That's where most of the training goes on, up at higher altitudes. Do you, are you familiar with that? How long does a red blood cell last? 120 days. Does hypoxia stimulate EPO release? Yes. So let me ask you this. If I go up at a higher level and train, will I make more red blood cells? And I refresh my memory again, how long do they last for? 120 days. So I got three months. So if I'm training at a higher level and then I come down to train in a marathon, won't I have more red blood cells than everybody else? Won't I have a better oxygen carrying capacity? Will it take me longer to get that lactic acid burn? Yes, it will. Is that why, who do you think wins the New York Marathon every year? Kenyans. Right. You, you, you know, the cameras are on the, are on the back of a motorcycle, and they're filming the runners, and you see the sweat, and, the patient, and, and these individuals are looking so damn cachectic, and you're like, man, this guy's going to die. And then they race up to the front of the race, and they pan over to the Kenyans, and they're like, you know, they just got a big old smile on their face. There's no sweat. They're feeling good. Yeah. Why? Because they have a higher red count from training at higher altitudes greater than sea level. Do you know what you get for winning the marathons? A lot of money and a Mercedes, a Mercedes. So Dr. Francis was telling me, he said it's funny uh, when you go back, uh, when he takes trips home and things like that, he can tell exactly who won the marathon because here's a grass hut and a Mercedes sitting right out in front of it. So, <laughs> so yeah, he won the marathon. So. <laughs> All right, so dehydration is, or Gossbach syndrome, meaning not a true or what we call relative. Uh, stress polycythemia is another name for it. And the bottom line is I'm losing plasma volume. So it's not an increase. It looks like an increase. So what would be your next best step in management for these patients? What is it? Hydrate. Hydrate. Give them what they lost. Give them what they lost. I can't tell you the number of patients that have come in in a dehydrated state and all of a sudden a resident wants to turn around, or an intern I should say, wants to turn around and start throwing some meds on them. 
oh, let's bring up his pressure. pressure. Let's, let's, let's give him some uh, dopamine levels and, and pressers and things. No, give them what they lost. Put fluid on board. Okay. And then they start chasing the red count and things like that. All right. So polycythemia with increased EPO. So Al, run me with this, through this. Increased erythropoietins due to hypoxia. That kind of makes sense, doesn't it? Should increase with hypoxia. Acute hypoxia and most common signs, symptoms, tachypnea and dyspnea, which you have been taught already, is what I would see. Chronic hypoxia, we get clubbing, clubbing. You guys know what that is? Yeah, the ends of their fingers, the pads of their fingers get really huge. I had a student here one month who came up to me after class and said, look, Dr. Wolf, her pads were the size of quarters on the end. Size of quarters. She had a restrictive lung disease uh, when she was a child and basically uh, ha has dealt with it. But think about this. Wait a second. Refresh my memory again. What is the purpose of microvilli? Absorption. Increased surface area, right? Well, think about this. Where do, where do I exchange O2 and CO2? Lungs, as well as, where's the periphery? The capillary beds, right? So the body, remember I told you, constantly tries to fix things that are out of balance. The problem is, is it's not always the proper thing to do. So if I turn around and I have a problem with O2, CO2 exchange, the body's going to release, as you can see there, angiogenin to make new blood vessels, new surface area. Folks, that's why their fingers start to swell, because there's a whole bunch of capillary beds at the end of that area. You can't change that. You can't change that. Right? So angiogenin. Restrictive lung disease, such as maybe, uh, well, remember, restrictive lung disease, COPD is obstructive, but it can also be restrictive too, correct? Well, emphysema. Uh, renal cell carcinoma in adults, I know that I have a tumor there kicking out a whole bunch of EPOs. In a child, as you can see, we call that Wilms tumor, right? So, if you have a patient who has polycythemia, increased erythropoietins, there's two possibilities hypoxia or some type of tumor. If they have polycythemia and normal EPOs, what's the diagnosis again? Dehydration. dehydration. Drop down, pick an answer associated with dehydration. Low volume state. And last but not least, you have polycythemia and increased erythropoietins, or I'm sorry, decreased erythropoietins. Decreased, not normal, but decreased. Decreased erythropoietins, folks, is bone cancer until proven otherwise. Bone cancer until proven otherwise. The cancer we call it is polycythemia rubrovera. Polycythemia rubrovera. How do I know? How would they present this in a vignette? They'll tell you the person gets out of a shower and is itching everywhere, just scratching everywhere. Why? Because the myelogenous line releases also basophils, and that's what's causing the itching, the heat response to that. So polycythemia rubrovera. Also, they'll give you what they call essential thrombocytopenia. Let's talk about the word essential for a second. What's the most common cause of hypertension? What is it? Essential. Essential. That's the most common. What is that? You have it. You have it. Sorry, Mrs. Johnson. You just have it. <laughs> Anybody else? Idiopathic? Oh. But isn't that the same as essential? Hmm. Why do we have terms that mean absolutely nothing? All right, let, let me paint a picture for you. Mr. Johnson comes in, right? He has tra transportation problems, but finally he gets into your office. And he steps into your office, and you do the blood pressure, and this turns out to be the third time that he's there. And you say, Mr. Johnson, you have hypertension. He goes, okay, doc, why? I don't know. What do you think he's going to do? He's going to get up out of that chair. He's going to walk over to the wall, and he's going to look real close at that diploma you have on the wall, and he's going to wonder where the hell you went to school because he took all that trouble to get there, and you tell him you have no clue. He's going to have a problem with that, right? But if I turn around and say, Mr. Johnson, you have hypertension, and I believe it's essential. Woo! He's got the diagnosis. He's okay. Mr. Johnson's going to go home and call baby, baby. Listen, I have essential hypertension, but I can deal with it. I'm on drugs. Doc told me I'd be okay. He's going to call everybody and tell them that he has essential hypertension. But you know, patients started to catch on to that, right? 
Doc told you you had essential? Ah, that doesn't mean anything. So what do we have to come with, up with? You got idiopathic. Oh, okay, thanks. So we keep changing terminology, but the bottom line is to give, we don't know, but we're trying to give the patient some rest that they have a name to their diagnosis, and that's really all it is. So essential thrombocytopenia, do we have any clue why it's high? No. Remember essential, we do not know why it's high. Normal range, 150 to 350,000 platelets. They're going to give you a range off the chart. Off the chart, 600,000, 700,000. So a patient comes out of the shower, starts itching, and they give you a thrombocyte count. Oh, I don't know, 700,000? You got your diagnosis. Polycythemia rubrovera. Okay? But wait a second. How could I confirm this diagnosis? How do we confirm? Biopsy. Biopsy. Good. All right, so moving on to the adrenal. Everybody all right? All right, moving on to the adrenal. With the adrenal gland, they may call it suprarenal. Real fancy, right? Isn't that just above the kidneys? Suprarenal, adrenal. And then you go, oh, shoot, what the hell are they talking about? You start panicking. Above the adrenal, above the uh, kidney or renal system, remember I have a capsule, I have the three layers, the zona glomerulosis, zona fasciculata and the zona reticularis. As I have there, remember the zona glomerulosis is aldosterone, stimulated by angiotensinogen 2. We have zona fasciculata, which is cortisol, ACTH, and zona reticularis is androgens, which is ACTH. How could they possibly test you on this? If I have two different pathways to stimulate three things there, maybe I'll give you a disease process where I'll knock out one of them. What if they give you a situation where a woman is postpartum and she had a hemorrhage, massive hemorrhage, and now she can't lactate anymore and things like that? What is a woman at risk for postpartum hemorrhage? What, what disease process do we call that? She hands, right, she hands. It's affecting that pituitary. Were those fat soluble or water soluble hormones? Water soluble, remember, from the pituitary. So all of a sudden, I may turn around and ask you, based off of that, what pathway is affected? Which one of those are affected? Does, uh, does angiotensinogen 2 come from the pituitary? Or does ACTH? ACTH. So would I affect aldosterone? No. So I know that her blood pressure should be fine. It's her cortisol levels and her androgen levels that are affected. That's how they test you on that, okay, versus memorizing a picture. All right, so let's talk about a concept here called low volume state. Low volume state. If anybody has a low volume state, we call that pre-renal. Pre-renal. Yes, when we talk about kidney and all that, we're going to talk about why is it's 20 to 1. What the heck does that mean? And I'll show you how ridiculously simple that is. But the bottom line is if I turn around and I have decreased volume going to the kidneys for whatever reason, oh, I don't know. You're thinking probably right now, how could I have decreased volume? If somebody cuts themselves, they bleed. They would have decreased volume, right? That's simple enough. Somebody doesn't drink enough, they're going to have decreased volume. Simple enough. How about if somebody has a burn? A burn patient, would they have decreased volume? Yes, because don't they get edema? Won't I be emptying out the pipes? That's what happens. That's how they're going to do it, okay? They're not going to give you the obvious. They'll give you shifts in fluid, and I have decreased uh, fluid volumes. That's why we always put more fluid on volume on day one and day two, not day three for burn patients, because they have a massive diuresis day three. So if I have a lot of, uh, or let's say, a, a decrease in volume, Who's going to recognize that? Who? What, what part of the kidneys? I'll, I'll help you out. JG apparatus. What's it going to secrete? Renin. Renin, right. Renin will be released from the JG apparatus in a low volume state. That will be the stimulus. Where's renin going to go? Where's renin going to go? Somebody? Liver. It's going to go to the liver. And it's going to meet up with who? Angiotensinogen. Very good. So it's going to meet up in the liver with angiotensinogen. 
And what's the progeny? Angiotensin 1. Who's going to go over to? Meet up with? Ace in the lungs. And what's their progeny going to be? Angiotensinogen 2. Very good. That's the pathway of low volume state. I will always go that way anytime I have decreased volume, decreased volume within the body. Decreased volume. So if I stimulate this pathway, again, refresh my memory again, why am I stimulating this pathway? What is it? Low volume. So if I have decreased volume, then maybe angiotensinogen's function is to increase volume. Do you agree? That's it. So, how does it do that? Well, the first thing it does is it fools the body. Let's say I have a pipe and it's only half full of water. If I constrict that pipe, won't I fool the body to think that pipe is full? Yeah. Alpha-1 vasoconstriction is the first thing angiotensinogen 2 does. Alpha-1 vasoconstriction is the very first thing angiotensinogen 2 does. Let me ask you this, can your body stay in a constricted state for a length of, a, an extended, can bless you, run, an extended length of time? No. The reason I said run is because if you're stressed out, you're going to get sick, right? You're going to get sick. You're immunosuppressed. If you get sick, I get sick. I have two vehicles. I have a Beamer and a Hummer. I'll chase you down with the Hummer. <laughs> run, 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 exercise. You sneeze in class, I'm going to tell you the exercise. All right, got to exercise. Don't get sick. All right, so. Based off of this, alpha-1 vasoconstriction, vasoconstriction. Your body can't keep up with this for a long period of time. What's the next thing you think it's going to do? What do you, what do you think it's going to do? How about the zona glomerulosis? What stimul what's released from that zona glomerulosis? Aldosterone. Aldosterone. Aldosterone's function is to do what? Somebody help me out here. What does it bring in? Sodium. One sodium and how many waters? Three waters, right. One sodium and three waters. So if I bring in a sodium and three waters, sodium and three waters, couldn't that cause a dilutional effect? Simple enough, right? So I'm bringing in a sodium, but I'm also bringing in three waters. What's another thing it does? How about the uh, posterior pituitary? What does it release? ADH. ADH is responsible for stimulating or making V2 porins, which are channels on the basal lateral side, which is the blood vessel side, basal lateral side, so you take in more water. Would this cause a dilutional effect? Yeah, absolutely. And last but not least, the third and final thing it does is it stimulates the brain, stimulates the brain for thirst. Stimulates the brain for thirst. So low volume state, no fluid to the kidney or not enough, JG apparatus is going to be stimulated. JG apparatus will release renin, renin will go to the kidney, will go to the liver to stimulate angiotensinogen. Angiotensinogen's progeny will therefore be angiotensinogen 1. Angiotensinogen 1 goes to the lungs to meet up with ACE, and ultimately their progeny is angiotensinogen 2. The first thing it does is it causes vasoconstriction by alpha 1, making the pipes look smaller. Simulates zona glomerulus, uh, causing release of aldosterone, stimulating the absorption of sodium in three waters, Stimulate in the posterior pituitary to bring in ADH or release ADH so you bring in water. And last but not least, stimulates the brain for thirst. You can see a lot of different ways. So refresh my memory again. What is the most common cause of hypertension in the United States? Essential, meaning we have no clue. We have no clue. Let me ask you this. I could give a beta blocker for hypertension, couldn't I? I could give a calcium channel blocker for hypertension too, couldn't I? Do they decrease mortality in hypertension? What is the one drug that decreases mortality? 
ACE inhibitor. ACE inhibitor. Refresh my memory again. What, what is the most common uh, hypertension? And that means we don't know what causes it, right? But I can give a beta blocker to decrease preload a little bit. I can give a calcium channel blocker to affect preload, afterload, eh, kind of. But I can give an ACE inhibitor that's going to knock out all four of these since I have no clue of the cause of hypertension. That's why, folks, that is exactly why ACE inhibitors decrease mortality. All right. Essential hypertension is due to low volume? Sure. It, the bottom line is essential. We have no, there's no pathological presentation. Obviously, if somebody has renal artery stenosis, I can diagnose that as the cause of his hypertension. But if the pipes are clear and every test comes back normal, but you still have hypertension, I don't know what the cause is. That's, that would be essential. Okay? All right. Now that we know about the low volume state, Let's talk about the adrenal cortex. The zone of glomerulosis aldosterone stimulus is hypovolemia. Oh, imagine that. Low volume. Hyponatremia. Doesn't water follow salt? So if I'm losing sodium, I must be losing water. And hyperkalemia, and remember, sodium potassium switch. So if I have high potassium, I obviously must have low sodium. So those are the stimuluses. Inhibition, if you have a fluid overload. No reason to stimulate the renin angiotensinogen system. Where does it go? Late DCT. Also, in parentheses, I want you to put behind there collecting ducts. Old board questions say late DCT. The newer board questions say collecting ducts. Both of them are in the test pool. You'll never have both answers on a question. It'll be one or the other. Okay. What it does stimulates the synthesis of the sodium potassium pump, and second messenger is none. Why? Why is there no second messenger? Steroid hormone. Very good. Steroid hormone. So again, aldosterone is the bottom line is for taking in sodium and water. Okay? What did you want us to put after late DCT? Oh, uh, collecting duct. Collecting duct. Because technically the principal cells are being affected. Principal cells are in the late distal convoluted tubule as well as the collecting duct. So both answers are correct. All right, so aldosterone, if I have too much, too much. Think about this renin-angiotensinogen system for a second that we just talked about. You said that via the zona glomerulosis, I'm bringing in one sodium and how many waters? Three. So it's kind of a dilutional effect, right? Then I'm bringing in ADH, which is just bringing in straight water. This is the thing. We have a hormone in the heart called ANP, atrial nitritic peptide, and in the ventricles, it's BNP. How they respond is at like a diuretic. If I have too much volume they're gonna, and get a stretch in those areas, they're going to release their, basically it's a hormone, and then I'm going to dump off water. So think about this. If I bring in a sodium and I bring in three waters, via, won't I increase my volume? So what actually happens is the body starts to compensate for that, and you start to lose the two additional waters. So the sodium bringing in via the three waters starts off with an initial dilutional effect, but then the body will start balancing that out. Let me ask you this. The ADH, is it, it's just water, correct? So between the two, which one do you think causes the dilutional effect? Is there the zona glomerulosis with aldosterone or ADH? ADH. And I'm about to prove that to you. Why? If I have a syndrome called Kahn's, Kahn's syndrome, Kahn's syndrome is too much aldosterone. Aldosterone, too much. If I have too much aldosterone, do they have ADH at all in, with this syndrome? Yes or no? No, there's no ADH. We're not doing the renin-angiotensinogen system. This is just a tumor kicking out a lot of aldosterone. So if I have a lot of aldosterone, how the heck could you explain hypernatremia? Because if I bring in one sodium and three waters, shouldn't I have a dilutional effect? You should. But because there's no ADH here, the body compensates for that and gets rid of those additional waters. Yes. Uh, 
Why is it? It's a uh, well. <laughs> it's essential. No. <laughs> uh, from the biochem point of view, specifically, I couldn't answer that. But it's. Uh, it, I don't want to blow smoke. Uh, really. It's just the. Let me. You brought up a very good point. When I look at multiple books, they'll say one sodium and one water. Why? Because that's the end result. That's the net effect because I'm losing that. But initially, I'm bringing in one sodium and three waters, and I will lose those two additional waters. The biochemical properties of why it's three, not four, not two, couldn't tell you that. But valid question. All right, so Kahn syndrome, hypernatremia, because I'm bringing in that sodium, I'm bringing in three waters, so therefore, it's not going to cause a dilutional effect. They have hypernatremia versus hypokalemia. Why? Because potassium can freely filter out of the cell. Remember, potassium is the only electrolyte that's the most within a cell. It always wants to freely come out. Think of all other electrolytes outside the cell trying to get in. So potassium can freely float out of the cell. Alkalosis, because there's a hydrogen potassium exchanger. Hydrogen potassium exchanger. So what actually happens here, again, is anytime I have hydrogens, they want to rush into the cell. They want to rush into the cell. Why? Think about this for a second. If I have an acidotic state and I have a bunch of hydrogens floating around, couldn't the hydrogens, therefore being an acid environment, denature protein? Wouldn't I start to denature my cells, my vessels and things like that? So the body tries to fix that, taking hydrogens into the cell, therefore giving potassium out. So isn't that what happens in DKA? An insulin patient in DKA, aren't they in metabolic acidosis? Yes or no? Yes. Do they have hyper or hypokalemia? Hyper or hypokalemia? Okay. This is the key. Some books say hyper, some say hypo. Let me explain the theory to you here. If I turn around and take a hydrogen into the cell, I take potassium out. Potassium is therefore in serum, so they have hyperkalemia. Is that a true hyperkalemia or an ion shift? Ion shift, not a true hyperkalemia. Now, look what happens here. So now I have that high potassium. What would I see on EKG? Peak T waves. Very good. Peak T waves. Does the body like hyperkalemic state? No. So who's going to fix that? kidneys. How long does it take? Two to three days. Two to three days and the kidney's going to start dumping off that potassium. Is that a true or false hypokalemia? True, because they're really excreting it from the body. I'm not shifting it to another location. So, do we usually see diabetic patients or DKA patients in the first two to three days? If you've been on the wards, no way. No way! They'll come in a week, two, three weeks later, a family member brings them in. So you're going to see them in a hyper or hypokalemic state? Hypo. Is that why we hang a banana bag? Give them potassium? Because when I give them insulin, and insulin takes that glucose into the cell, who rides shotgun? Potassium. So they're already in a hypokalemic state, right? And then I give them insulin. Won't I make that situation even worse? Yeah, so that's why we put potassium on. Okay. All right. And hypertension because of the three waters with the sodium. All right. Now, what if I have too little, too little adrenal insufficiency? Now, I know you guys uh, studied um, the 21 hydroxylase deficiency, the 11 hydroxylase deficiency. Oh, you know, I can hear the hums already. So, <laughs> yeah, get it in, get it out, get it for the test, get it out of my head. I don't want to know this anymore. And you had a really hard time, right? Is it high? Is it low? Is this? Is there genitalia there? Is there genitalia is not? Oh, who cares? Right? But those pathologists kept shoving this down your throat. Oh, you got to know 11. You got to know 21. You got to know 17. Let me ask you this. Are you ready to learn it really easy? I'll show you how incredibly easy this is. And then you're going to get really ticked off at who originally taught you it. <laughs> how easy this is. Number one, 17, they don't ask on the boards. So are you going to study 17? Yeah. All right. <laughs> it's already getting easy, isn't it? Look at this. All right, this is what happens, folks. Why don't they ask 17? You're not going to see it. 
remember, out of the 350 questions you're going to get on the boards, it's going to be things that will present to your office. So I'm giving you an example. What are the three trisomies that you're going to see? 13, mm -hmm. 18. Uh-huh. Right. 13 and 18 only usually make it to a year. Have you ever studied trisomy 6? No. Tri tr trisomy, oh, I don't know, 11? Are they going to ask you about those? Hmm. They're going to ask you about 17? No. All right. Good, good. This is good, good. All right. Now we're catching on. <laughs> All right. Cholesterol. We all need it. We all need it, folks. If you think that it is good to go on a fat-free diet, you're crazy. You're crazy. If you want to go on a fat-free diet because you're running and when you stop, your, your hips don't, that doesn't, that doesn't mean go on a diet. <laughs> I'm telling you, hey, we have a joke going here. We, uh, students arrive here in jeans and nice clothing, and when they leave, they got different color sweatpants because, uh, you know, you're snacking while you're eating the, uh, on the computer and things like that. So we see it. You, folks, if you show up with different color sweatpants, we can tell. <laughs> so... <laughs> you, you got to exercise while you're here. You have to. Remember, this is real stressful. Cholesterol. Do not, folks, do not go on a fat-free diet. That's crazy. If, let me ask you this. If you have a fat-free diet, you know that every cell in your body is made up of fat, right? Are you going to affect your menstrual cycle? Well, okay, maybe that's not that such a bad thing. Uh, you, no, don't. <laughs> don't be going on a fat-free diet for that. But listen, every cell in your body needs that. So if you go on a fat-free diet, you're going to affect every part of your body. It's a really dangerous thing to do. What's the second most dangerous thing you could do is a starvation diet. That makes no sense to me. None whatsoever. Why? Because day one, you're okay, right? You're drinking that water, getting that stretch reflex in your stomach. Day two, ooh, I don't know. You got that gurgling in your stomach. You have a smell of food going around. But hey, you get on that scale and you're losing weight, right? Those numbers are going down. Are you losing weight or are you losing water? Water. And then day three, oh, man, you can't handle it anymore. And you're driving down the road, and all of a sudden there's this big marquee out there, Chinese buffet, two ninety nine. Woo! You're full in there, and all of a sudden you're like an ostrich with your face down in there, your butt up in the air, and you're just gnawing on that bacillus cereus, trying to get all that rice down your throat at that point. <laughs> binge, binge, binge eating, binge eating. Don't starve yourself, folks. Do you know how to lose weight? You know you should eat frequent meals every day, right? You know that, right? Think about this. If I turn around and I have a big lunch, a lot of that food, carbohydrates, turns to sugar. Do you agree? If I, m I put a massive amount of glucose in my body, won't I release a lot of insulin? Is my pancreas smart enough to say, mm -hmm. I'll just make a fictitious number. There's 100 units of glucose, so I better make only 100 units of insulin? No. You're going to get an overshoot. So if I binge eat, I'll make myself hypoglycemic. Chinese food, isn't that packed full of carbohydrates? Carbohydrates are notorious for being converted to sugar. And then what happens when you're hypoglycemic? You also are hungry at that point because you're stimulating the hunger center. Have you ever noticed that when you eat Chinese food, two hours later, you're like, woo, let's go get a pizza. It's like, what the hell? You just ate a whole buffet. Yeah, it's because your insulin's bouncing around. But if I would turn around and eat frequent meals throughout the day, little meals, you see how I would regulate my glucose level throughout the day? And ultimately, you wouldn't get that binge of desire to, to binge eat. All right, so eat frequent meals. All right, I digress. Cholesterol. Cholesterol goes to preg, uh, let's see, pregnenolone. Pregnenolone, and pregnenolone converts to progesterone. Progesterone has three pathways. Well, it has the 17 hydroxylase, ultimately androgens. It can go to the cortisol pathway. And last but not least, it can go to the aldosterone pathway. Simple enough so far, right? I know you guys drew out that big diagram. 
in medical school and learned every stinking enzyme on there and everything that's happening? How about if I tell you you only have to know one enzyme? Sounds pretty good, doesn't it? One enzyme. One enzyme only. That enzyme, let me just interject something here. Remember, we have 21 and 11, right? 21 and 11. The only enzyme you have to know is something called 11 deoxy cortico sterone. It's a mouthful. It sits right between 21 and 11. It sits right between 21 and 11. Why do I want you to know that enzyme? In high levels, that enzyme acts, not is, acts like aldosterone. Acts like aldosterone. So if it acts like aldosterone, what would its function then be? To reabsorb what? Sodium and water. If it acts like aldosterone, it'll cause reabsorption of sodium and water. So let me ask you this. If I have a 21 deficiency, what was that rule again in endocrine? Wherever the error is, what happens to everything below that error? Decreases. Everything above that error? Increases. Very good. So if I have a 21 deficiency, can I go the aldosterone route? Can I go the cortisol route? Can I go the androgen route? Yeah. That's where everything's going to go. So maybe we call it virilization? Hmm. Virilization. Sure. If I turn around and can't figure out what the heck's down there below, maybe they went over to the androgen route. If they can't do 21, I know they don't have aldosterone. I know they don't have cortisol. If they don't have aldosterone, are they going to have hypertension or hypotension? Hypotension. So you mean to tell me if I have to diagnose 21, they have to have hypotension and virilization? That's it? But wait a second. It can't be that easy. What if somebody has 11 deficiency? Can they make aldosterone? Can they make aldosterone? Is it below it? Yes, so they can't make it. Can they make cortisol? No. Are they going to make a lot of androgens? Hmm, maybe virilization? Ooh, can I tell the difference between 11 and 21 based off of virilization? No. But let me ask you this. What did I say again? Let's refresh our memory. If I have an error, what happens to everything below it? Decreases everything above it? Increases. Is 11 deoxycorticosterone above 11? Yes. So will that level increase if I have 11 deficiency? Well, what will happen to their blood pressure? Goes up because it acts like aldosterone. So you mean to tell me if they give me a kid who's got virilization and hypotension, it's 21? If they give me a kid who's got virilization and hypertension, it's 11? That's it. That's it. If you guys think it's more than that, you're crazy. You bring me a question that shows more than that, fantastic. I haven't seen one. It's that simple. Everybody understand? Was that simple? Cortisol, sure. I do have 11 deoxycorticosterone over here between 21 and 11, but it doesn't act like cortisol at high levels. It's just an enzyme that's there. Cortisol itself, if I block 21, I'm blocking 21 in both pathways. Do you agree? If I block 11, I block 11 in both pathways. Bottom line is I'm not making cortisol. Do you follow? Yeah, I follow. Okay. All right, that's it. Cortisol, pregnenolone, progesterone, and again, ultimately, aldosterone, cortisol, and androgens. Everybody okay? All right. So in adults, ab abrupt withdrawal steroids, uh, autoimmune adrenitis, things that could affect the adrenal glands. So again, too little, adrenal insufficiency, 21 21, is that hypertension or hypotension? Hypo. 11? Hyper. Virilization going to help you out? All right. <laughs> 21 beta hydroxylase deficiency, a decrease in aldosterone. Remember, it's a mineral corticoid. Sodium wasting, and ultimately hypotension. Low cortisol, which is the glucocorticoids, and low feedback via ACTH, and increased androgens virilization. If I'm looking at 11, Excess 11-deoxycorticosterone, which is the only enzyme I want you to know, 
retains salt, therefore you have hypertension. Aldosterone decreases, so desmolase uh, is the rate-limiting enzyme step in the pathway, allosteric activator of angiotensinogen 2, down regulation due to the hypertension. Remember, you're going to have low cortisol and you're going to have virilization. So it's very simple. Okay. All right, next one, zona fasciculata. Zona fasciculata. I know cortisol is coming from this pathway. Cortisol from the zona fasciculata. So how would I stimulate it? Stimulus would be stress or hypoglycemia. Would hypoglycemia be a stressful event? Sure. Cortisol, being one of your stress hormones, also stimulates increased sugar release. So that's why hypoglycemia is a stimulus. Inhibition, hyperglycemia. I don't need any more sugar. Where does it go? It loves nobody. It loves nobody. It's permissive. It's creating a harem. It's going everywhere. What it does? Upregulates all receptors. Upregulates all receptors during stress. Cortisol will also cause that mental block, correct? When you get called upon, outside of hearing a really loud pop, which is your sphincter tightening, and we always hear that. Hear that snap, yeah, and you're getting called upon. See, folks, when you get called upon and you're sitting next to that person, it's pretty easy to answer the question, isn't it? Because you're not getting called upon. But as soon as you get called upon, oh, he had the easier one. That's not fair. I don't think so. <laughs> it's ideal. It's just one of the things that happens when you get called upon. You get pimped. All right, the second messenger is none. Now, let's go through some cortisol information here. Cortisol itself is obviously a stress hormone. Physiological effects, breaks down protein, gluconeogenesis, because I told you it's going to basically increase glucose levels. Anti-inflammatory kills T cells and eosinophils, inhibits macrophages, stabilizes endothelium, stabilizes mast cells, inhibits phospholipase A. So let me ask you this. Cortisols can cause immunosuppression, correct? It's everything I just basically read to you. So let me ask you this. If cortisol causes immunosuppression, if you're here studying for the test, not exercising, are you going to get sick? Yeah, you really will. You will, and you'll blame it on your roommates. Oh, damn it, he sneezed all over the place. Uh, the pots and pans are dirty, and now I caught a cold from him. Hmm. But you're stressed out because your test is coming up in five days. Let me ask you this. Let me give you another analogy. Mama told you when you were a kid, and it was cold outside, you must wear a jacket or you're going to catch a cold. Right? Isn't that what she said? Put your jacket on. You're going to catch a cold. Was Mama right? Ooh. <laughs> all right. First of all, rule of thumb. Mama's always right. <laughs> Even if she's wrong, Mama's always right. Mama carries a big hand. Right? <clears throat> Mama's always right. You know, when I was little, I always got beat first thing in the morning because they knew I was going to misbehave throughout the day. <laughs> they just knew it. So they thought they'd get it out of the way. So <laughs> I laugh at kids nowadays because, you know, uh, parents are like, Johnny, go sit in the corner. There's a timeout. No, Johnny needs a swift kick in the ass is what he needs, right? And then all of a sudden we say, oh, it's ADHD. Let's give him some, uh, you know, methylphenidate or something like that. No. You need to give some corporal punishment to Johnny, and then he'll straighten out, right? Yeah. I mean, nowadays, don't you see, like, uh, the kid protectors? They, they uh, put the uh, little plastic protectors over that wall outlets and things like that so kids won't stick something in there. My dad gave me a screwdriver to stick something in there when I was playing with it one day because he said, once he does it, he'll never do it again. Boy, was he right. Man, did that hurt. And I was little, and I still remember that. But yeah, then they have all these protective things. So I'm battling that out with my wife right now. <laughs> Let them fall from a tree. They'll remember. <laughs> all right, so back to mama. So mama says, put on your jacket, right? Or you're going to get sick. All right, so this is you now. So you come out of the house, got your ball cap on sideways. Your pants are all the way down to the crack of your you-know-what. Because it's cool, right? You got to have your jeans all the way down. You have your iPod in your ears, your book bag. Obviously, it's, it's kind of weird to put both shoulders on, so you've got to have it only on one shoulder because you're cool then, right? 
and you go to the bus stop, and you're standing there, and everybody else is dressed, and they're all warm, and you know, you're, you're bebopping to your music, but it's not because of the beat, it's because you're so damn cold, you're shivering, and you're just kind of bebopping to the music to make it look like you're listening to your iPod. Well, let me ask you this, is that a stressful event? Yeah. Is it going to lower your immune system? Okay, so your immune system's low, you get to school, and you get off the bus, and you go into your locker, and your buddy's hanging out there who's got a runny nose, and he's taking his hand, wiping, and you come in, and he's like, hey, what's up, man? And you slap his hand. And when you slap his hand, all of a sudden your eye starts to itch, and you start rubbing your eyes. You're going to get sick? Yeah. Was mama right? Mama's always right. <laughs> so, yep, 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 yep. Yes. Yes. What about the other side? Like you actually like decrease your cortisol levels, because exercise is stressful too. So oh, I agree wholeheartedly with you. Initially, I laugh about that because you know how we talk about you get that lactic burn when you start exercising, and then as you exercise, your endorphins should kick in, you know, and you feel that runner's high. I'm still looking for the high. I have never found it. It hurts like hell when I run. <laughs> Oh my gosh, lactic acid burn supposed to build up? I start with the lactic acid. It just, oh, I hate running. Well, what happens is it's stressful. Your cortisol levels go up based off of what, what kind of shape you're in, right? Because it's more difficult to your body. But remember, cortisol is not the only stress hormone. And then base, what's going to happen is if I start exercising, I'm going to get this rush of cortisol, but it's also going to cause negative feedback. Therefore, ACTH will decrease and it all. So it all balances out. So good question. All right, so cortisol, too little, adrenal insufficiency. I don't know, we call that Addison's disease. Who, what famous person had Addison's disease? JFK. Yeah, JFK. So this is what happens. All right, so in the hypothalamus, we have CRH. Let me give you a, a little clue when I teach, folks. I love to draw. My, the reason I love to draw is because I'm trying to stimulate two of your senses sound as well as sight. If you draw it out, there's a double chance that you're going to pick it up. If I stand up here and just read to you, well, I don't know, maybe like another review course, um, then ult ultimately <laughs> it goes in this ear and comes right back out that one, right? Not going to do that. In your notes, you have colored pages. Uh, for we change the color of the pages so you have areas to draw. Okay, that's why those are there. Use them. I draw all the time. All right. So hypothalamus, CRH, comes down, and it's P-O-M-C, uh, pro-opionic, who cares? And don't be a pebble flipper, let it go. And then A-C-T-H, right? So the bottom line is I have A-C-T-H. A-C-T-H is going to go down to the adrenal gland. What part of the adrenal gland does it stimulate? What part does A-C-T-H stimulate? The cortex, what part of the cortex? The outer layer of the cortex? Fasciculata and reticularis, right? Remember, ACTH stimulates both of those. But right now, we're going to talk about the fasciculata. For cortisol purposes, and ultimately, cortisol will be released, and it creates a negative feedback. That's the pathway. That's the ACTH pathway. I could screw up something in the pituitary, couldn't I? Would ACTH levels go up or down? Down, because it's after the insult, right? Would cortisol levels go up or down? Down. If I turn around and screw up the adrenal gland, what happens to ACTH levels? They increase because it's above where the deficit is. Remember that. So let's say I have a situation where the adrenals are fried. They're not working. Yes, I know that all the layers could be affected, but right now we're only talking about the zona fasciculata. What is a way that I could destroy the adrenals? Well, steroids is one. Is there a bacteria that can destroy it? Who? Nyceria, right. Waterhouse Fredrickson syndrome, isn't that what we call that? When I have a hematogenous destruction via Nyceria gonorrhea of the adrenals? Anything, oh, I don't know, maybe that kid did fall out of the tree and smash his adrenal gland. Whatever, I can destroy the adrenals. If I destroy the adrenals, what happens to ACTH levels again? They're going to increase. If they increase, they have to go somewhere. 
And they're going to go over, and they're going to make something called, or stimulate something called beta lipotropin. Beta lipotropin. Beta lipotropin then stimulates melanocyte stimulating hormone and your endorphins. Now, Matthew, back to your original comment where basically you said CRH, POMC, ACTH, when I exercise, I'll have a lot of cortisol. Isn't that bad? And I get the negative feedback. But you get such a flush of ACTH. It does cause that, but you get something called transport maximum. So I have a lot of ACTH laying around. Where's it going to go? The beta lipotropin pathway. Is that why when you exercise on a regular basis, your skin starts to tan a little bit? Is that why when you're stressed, you start to tan a little bit? Hmm, imagine that. It's because I'm stimulating the endorphins and the melanocyte stimulating hor hormones. Folks, I told you about that runner's high, the one I can't seem to find. It's due to endorphins because you get a massive flood of ACTH stimulating those endorphins, and then you're not supposed to feel anything after a mile. Bull crap. <laughs> yeah, endorphins, and this is what happens, okay? This is the pathway. This is what happens in Addison's disease. Now, they tell you that they get tanning everywhere. That's kind of a little bit of a far stretch. What actually happens if you flip over your hand and look at the crease lines, those of you with uh, a simian crease, come see me after class, but <laughs> you, you look at your palm lines and those are what darken, okay? Those are what actually gets dark. So when they tell you a patient on the palm, the, the life lines are darkening, that's what's going on there. <laughs> All right, so that's uh, adrenal insufficiency, Addison's disease. But what if I take just the opposite of that and I have too much? Cushing syndrome. Cushing syndrome. Well, you know, I, when I was studying this stuff for the first time, I had a hard time because half the books would say Cushing syndrome. Half of them would say Cushing's disease. How the heck do I know which is which? And I would always get that mixed up. First of all, Cushing syndrome is an umbrella name for all of them, okay? Umbrella name. Now, how do I decide between the two? Big blue letters at the bottom says disease affects one organ, syndrome affects many organs. Let me explain that to you. If I have Cushing's disease, it's either ectopic from the lungs, like small cell carcinoma, or I have a pituitary tumor, kicking out a lot of ACTH. Either or, both of them are secreting ACTH, correct? Aren't both of them, that ACTH, going to the adrenal gland? One gland? So if it's ectopic, it's Cushing's disease. Pituitary, Cushing's disease. Let me ask you this. If I have a tumor in the adrenal gland and it's kicking out a lot of cortisol, cortisol is permissive, if I remember correctly, right? It's going to go to a lot of different organs. Cushing syndrome. That's the difference, okay? Cushing syndrome. All right, so let's take a look at this. Cushing's. Cushing's. Well, I told you I could turn around and I could have a pituitary adenoma where I'm kicking out a lot of ACTH. Is that syndrome or disease? Disease. I could have small cell carcinoma tumor kicking out a lot of ACTH. Is that disease or syndrome? Disease. And I could basically have my adrenal gland with a tumor here kicking out a tremendous amount of cortisol. And is that syndrome or disease? Cushing syndrome. All right. It's important to get that right because sometimes I play semantics on the questions and you need to understand that. Well, if I have a patient who comes in with Cushing's, you know it's the pathognomonic, right? The buffalo hump, the, the purple stria because Cushing's breaks down the collagen in that area and that's what's causing the thin, thinning of the skin. You start to see the blood vessels under it, things like that. So pathognomonic, truncal obesity, you know, we've seen all those, right? So I'll come back to this. 
If I turn around and I think that somebody has Cushing's, I've got to figure it out. They have all the physiological features, the phenotypical look at looking at that patient. But how do I find out? So we give something called dexamethasone, which is a glucocorticoid. We give a low dose, which is a half a milligram. And what happens is if I'm giving this, I'm trying to shut down the whole axis, meaning there's just not enough cortisol to create negative feedback. But I'm just going to put a little bit more on board to give it enough to shut that axis down. That's the difference with low dose or high dose. If they tell you on the vignette there is low dose suppression, it's one of three things. Something what we call obesity, depression, or normal variant, which is a unique way of saying essential. Kind of all three go together a lot of times, don't they? Yeah, so we don't know. We don't know. So if they tell you on the boards that somebody has low dose dexamethasone suppression, drop down, pick one of these. Only one is on the list. Okay? But let's say you go ahead and you give this dexamethasone and there's no suppression of the whole axis. So what we do? we double the dose. We give one. One milligram, which we call high dose. High dose dexamethasone, if suppression occurs in high dose, you only have one answer and one answer only. It's a pituitary adenoma. Pituitary adenoma if I get high dose suppression. Don't consider any other answer, none whatsoever. High dose suppression, one milligram. Low dose suppression, what were the three again? Obesity, depression, normal variant. High dose, it's what? Pituitary. So let's say you have this patient here, has all the phenotypical signs of Cushing's disease, and you turn around and you push low dose. No change after 24 hours. You push high dose. There's no change. Well, you know it's not obesity, depression, or normal variant. You know it's not a pituitary tumor, so you've got two choices left. Ectopic lungs or the adrenal gland. Do you agree? Those are the only two choices you have left. What do they have in common? Or I should say lack what they have in common? One deals with ACTH, one deals with cortisol, correct? So how about measuring the ACTH levels? If I measure the ACTH levels after a high dose dexamethasone without suppression and the ACTH levels are elevated, shouldn't it be small cell carcinoma? Go get films of the chest, get an AP view. What if the ACTH levels are down? It's the adrenal gland. Go get an MRI. You guys know when you should do an MRI or CT? Well, number one, it's a hospital protocol. But when should you, and for the test, they usually choose uh, CT. But when do you want an MRI over a CT? When would you want? Let's say last month we had a student, we didn't, but let's say we did, who couldn't handle it and went up to the roof and jumped <laughs> and landed on his feet. You want a CT or MRI? Really? You sure? You ready to learn one word and one word only? I'm all about one words. Squishy. Can you remember that? Squishy. MRI. Squishy. Am I worried about the vertebral column or the cord for that jump? What am I more worried about? Cord. The cord. Is it squishy? Yep. You're going to do an MRI or CT? MRI. MRI for squishy things. If I'm looking at calcifications, maybe somebody has saponification, things like that, I'll choose a CT over that because it'll show up that area. Have you ever noticed on questions for step two and step three, if it just says CT, meaning with, not with or without contrast, just the word CT and just the word MRI, both of them are wrong? You already just got rid of two answers. Because hospital protocol, I don't know which one's which. Squishy. You guys can remember that, right? A couple months ago, I had a student here. I told her that, and she was watching a hockey game. And she's a big hockey fan. Uh, she was uh, from Michigan. Any Wolverines here? Good. Uh, anyway, so <laughs> go Bucks. So she was a um, she was a Wolverine fan. So, but I looked past that, and she, she was telling me that while she was watching this hockey game, this player got clipped from the side. And she's like, oh, that's squishy. He needs an MRI. And everybody's sitting there going, how the heck do you know that? You're nuts. Well, as the game progressed, they came, the announcer came back on and said, player such and such, uh, his MRI just showed. And they're like, wow, how'd you know that? 
I like her response. She said, well, a very well-known physician told me one day it's always squishy. I was like, yeah, that's a, that's a good response. So, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, the key is, is that uh, squishy MRI. All right? Remember that when you're on the wards. All right, so suppression doesn't occur. Remember, you're going to check ACTH.